Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the PMA CIBC Summit Series. Thank you everyone out in the audience today. As you know, we're in season five and we keep getting such strong support from everyone out in the industry. So thank you for that. My name is Chris Markovic. I'm the CEO of PMA Brether. This morning, we have four leaders from some of the country's most prominent development firms with us to share their experiences and perspectives on the current state today on housing in Canada. The theme for our session today is change and transition and the challenges that come with it. Together, our guests bring over 100 years of experience to the table, providing invaluable insight into the state of the market, how builders are working toward financial solutions for home buyers and finding peace of mind in, in a difficult climate. We know that many of you are gonna have questions for our panelists, so we encourage you to please type them into the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen. We will, I'll be going through them and review and we'll be pitching them to our panel uh, toward the end of the session. Be before we get started with our content and our session, Andy, you're gonna kick us off with a bit of an update on the market. Give us a little bit of a view as to what you've been up to the last couple of weeks and then we'll get going. Andy, over to you. Thanks, Chris, very much, and welcome everyone to spring. Spring, uh, hope, hope in spring is eternal, and hope springs eternal. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, I, we live in a world of optimism around us in our industry, and I, I can just feel it, I can feel the sense of it looking forward. You're gonna get the real picture from the low rise market this, this month's session. Next month, we'll flip over to high rise, but we'll kind of concentrate and focus on the low rise side this month's session. Uh, two weeks ago, I had the distinct honor and privilege to be invited to a panel with the governor of the Bank of Canada, uh, Tiff Macklin and his deputies. Uh, we were an hour and a half with about 15 people from across the country in finance, construction, uh, association, trade, supplier, service companies. Uh, we had a, a absolutely fantastic hour and a half with with the governor and his deputies it was a education it was an information exchange it was uh, uh, uh it was a missionary work as described by one and they was trying to give the governor the, the the goods on the housing scene and and uh it was private and confidential and therefore i was told i can't really talk about what the governor said and i won't but i will touch on some of the points that we talked about in a general sense as it relates both to our market and where we're going in this market. Let me tell you that the governor of the Bank of Canada gets it. I can't tell you how impressed I was with him. His insight, his inquisitiveness, his understanding, and his uh, level of knowledge about our, in our industry and the impact of rates on our industry was quite something. Now, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised by that. Uh, he's supposed to be the smartest guy in the room, <laughs> and he was. And uh, I couldn't ha help come away from the hour and a half with uh, the governor and his deputies with a sense of confidence that the independence of the Bank of Canada is an important entity in our structure in our country, and how much he appreciates his influence on the housing industry and on the consumer through rates and managing of fiscal policy. But at the same time, uh, he, he's trying to balance this uh, with his in fight against inflation. I, I came away with a really strong feeling. Anyway, some of the things that, that got talked about uh, in, in, the, in the most broadest terms, but were, were very, very strong. We're, I'll give you three and we're gonna talk about them this morning. Infrastructure was one. One of the things that came up was really interesting was the impact of, of course, DCs and where they're sitting right at the moment. But it's all about the financing for a municipality of how it's created and its impact on crumbling current infrastructure. Most of our cities across Canada, 100 years, 150 years old, and existing infrastructure crumbling completely. Well, DCs are frankly financing that. That's not fair. That's not not appropriate on the backs of new housing to finance an existing infrastructure. So new methodologies have to be found. But that's an interesting conflict that's going to have to be resolved. Immigration was a second. Immigration, a million people last year, a million, not not five hundred thousand in public policy, but a million, uh, including foreign students and 
temporary workers converting to permanent. Well, the system, we're all great supporters of immigration. It's important for our economic growth, but the system can't handle it. We just can't handle it. Housing can't keep up. Healthcare, social services, you name it, are under extreme strain from the levels of immigration. And the feds have been nibbling at the edges of this, but not really taking a strong position. It needs to have a really strong look and some relationship between probably housing starts and housing production and immigration. Otherwise, we'll just never, ever catch up. So that's a really important cornerstone. And the third was approval process. I recently had to do an analysis in Houston uh, of a piece of property for a client and, and and the interesting relationship of Houston versus GTA. Uh, by comparison, Houston is exactly the same GDP, uh, produces the same amount of goods and services as the GTA, has the same population base, about 6 million conurbation. Uh, in terms of its housing production, Houston's producing 60 to 70,000 units a year. Last year, we barely made 20. This year will be a less than 20. 40 has been our top notch level, 60 to 70,000 annual production out of Houston regularly. The average price of a home in Houston is $400,000 Canadian, million one our average price. Why? The approval process is 18 months. If Brad Carr's, I don't know whether they're actually in Houston, I, I, I'm about to explore that, but the, uh, the, the market is such that if you walk in the door, uh, you'll be, get approval within 18 months and you'll have a shovel in the ground. In, in, in the GTA, according to, to build study, it's 10 years, 10 years versus 18 months. There lies one of the key problems of our marketplace. From a market perspective of where we are and where we're going, uh, the word I use is percolating. The new home market is actually percolating stronger now than it has. We're 100% better than we were a year ago in the same month of February. That's remarkable. Now, the levels of production are, are operating at 50 to 70% below our 10-year average. But the trend line is up and improving slowly but surely on low rise, not high rise. High rise is a completely different story. In fact, you know, the February, March numbers are almost equal, high rise to low rise. Well, we haven't hit a 50-50 ratio like that for almost 20 years. So that's just a sign of the recovery on the low rise market beginning to take shape slowly, but surely. The key is mark to market. Can you find the actual price to mark to market to actually get the consumer to take action? Confidence is a huge factor in our market at the moment. The consumer's confused uncertain, frightened, uh, but in the same course of events, the smart consumer is about to take action now ahead of a rate cut that we expect probably sometime by June. So goodness gracious, if there's ever a timing factor in our business that says now's the time to buy, now I sound like a typical real estate guy, but this is the time, this is the time to take action. The smart consumers on the low rise side are taking that action. I'm going to stop it right there. It's a market clearly in transition, but getting slightly better. Uh, and the uh, I'm going to turn this right back to Chris to jump into our exciting group of panelists. Chris, back to you. Thanks, Andy. Before we jump right in, I want to quickly introduce our panel to the uh, to the audience. Uh, in no particular order, Lee Katsouris. Uh, Lee comes to us as the newly um, minted uh, head of sales and marketing over at Empire Communities. Welcome, Lee. You've got 15 years of experience in our industry across the GTA in Calgary. Um, with Cressford, prior to uh, your current role with Empire, you were uh, working very closely as head of sales marketing design at Metropia. And also, we're, we're Minto alumni, so it's great to have you with us today. Welcome and congratulations on your new role, Lee. Um, you. Brad, Brad, CEO of Madame Homes Canada. Uh, Brad was named CEO in 2018. Uh, he's been with Madame since 2013. We all know prior to that, he spent about and a baker's dozen of years, I think, at Monarch. Um, so under his current role, he has probably the best-in-class leadership team that we all know and are all seeing the results of today in the market. Um, he's responsible for all aspects of their home building uh, life cycle from acquisition to closing across the GTA, Ottawa, Calgary, and Edmonton. 
uh, leading a group of over 1,400 people over at Mattamy. Welcome, Brad. Um, Fred Lozani, uh, you know, Fred is, uh, Fred, you've been on, as well as Brad, you've been on this um, summit series with us previous. Thanks for joining us again. Um, everyone knows Lozani Holmes as, as a real leader um, in the GGH in Hamilton in Stony Creek. Um, and, uh, you know, that company, I think I'm I'm from the West, you know, always known Lozani out there since as long as I've been around since 1976, you know, a real uh, true um, immigrant success story. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Fred, uh, for joining us. And then finally, um, Sean Keeper. Uh, Sean is at the helm of Dunsire Communities. He oversees all operations, performance, and the overall growth of the organization. Um, he um, founded Dunsire, uh, apologies, right after uh, joining, um, graduating rather, uh, University of Waterloo with a degree in civil engineering. Um, he was also at, over there with Mattamy at one point. So um, some projects that Sean has really dug into include communities as small as two houses, all the way up to 3,200 homes in Southern Ontario, Alberta, currently in Jamaica, which is interesting. Love hearing about those stories. He also held uh, field supervision roles, um, working at the Four Seasons Centre for the Performing Arts and Pearson International Airport Terminal 1. Sean's an active member of the CHBA Net Zero Coun Council of Canada, OHBA and Terry on Liaison Committees, and a member of both PEO and APEGA. Sean, welcome. So let's dive right in. Um, to get us started, one word or phrase or sentiment that would describe your view on the current state. We'll start with Lee, then Brad, then Sean, and then you, Fred. Lee, what's your word or your phrase or your feeling? So my two words would be that I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, we've seen sales slow down, uh, and a part of that has been due to interest rates. And if the forecasts are correct, and we start to see a rate decrease in June or sometime this summer, then I'm cautiously optimistic that buyers will start to see today is a good time to buy a home. Thanks, Lee. Brad? I'm going to go with an old adage, back to basics. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, behaviors coming out of the frothy period of the last couple months that we need to root out of our industry. And I think that there's a real opportunity to take advantage of the pause in the market as we get ready for the next run. Perfect. Thank you. Sean? Uh, my word choice is opportunity. Uh, where there's a high level of challenges that we're seeing in our industry and in our marketplace, there's also comes a high level of opportunity. Pressure creates diamonds, right? Thank you. Got it. And then finally, Fred? Yeah, my words are going to be patience and preparedness. You know, we've been uh, we've been you know focusing to be prepared for this moment in time and the evolution of your cycle of our industry here. And uh, I've got a lot of nervous energy, uh, you know, based upon you know the 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 work that we've been doing to make sure that we're prepared to take advantage of the opportunities, much as has been said by my other cohorts here. But we're ready for it too, so uh, we're excited about what's happening you know, going forward. But we're nervous, and I think that that's good. I think that the sentiment is very, very, there's a, there's a thread, right? Go back to the basics. Slow and steady wins this race to a degree, retool, re reformat, and come out strong. Andy, do you want to take over? We're, and we're going to talk a little bit about the HST. Well, let's, yeah. uh, yes, my, my word had been percolating because we're feeling that sense of recovery. Um, and we, we expected this through the first half of 24 and then we need a signal. The consumer needs a signal to, to renew confidence and, and, and a sense of it's the right time to buy. And, and you'll hear from uh, the panelists now that, that uh, the smart consumer is jumping into this market right at this moment specifically. Uh, I want to throw a question really at Brad about infrastructure, HST. It's almost really a tax question more than anything else. Uh, uh, you know, the technical paper in 1989 when HST was brought to the pay, uh, to the table, uh, there's a there's a clause within the structure that that says uh, this tax shall not uh, cause an inordinate impact on the end selling price of housing, and that we will uh, modify and review the HST every two years. 
uh, that was in 1989 and it hasn't changed since. Uh, I think that's 34 years hence. So uh, really quite unbelievable uh, put in place and never modified. The, uh, the, but, but have we lost that battle would be one question, uh, uh, Brad. And one of the areas is how, as the offshoot of this, having raised hundreds of millions of dollars in, in HST, from the from the new housing industry uh do we see this as an opportunity to refocus uh towards infrastructure and secondarily on the infrastructure question does the municipality need new financial tools or a different way of all as opposed to burdening the backs of the new housing industry entirely and why dcs as our volume goes down development charges go up how incongruous but fundamental because they can't finance uh, the infrastructure of road sewers and 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 water so uh, sorry very long question but you'll have all the answers i know well, i certainly don't have all the answers andy um <laughs> otherwise i wouldn't have a job but uh, <laughs> um i think you and i have talked about this once before and so um having felt for some time like we are a noisy gong uh, when it comes to trying to convince government to reduce the HST on housing, I've begun to really lean in around an idea of trying to encourage a new deal around the HST and a deal that would hopefully create more certainty for the municipalities and the markets where housing is needed the most. Um, essentially the idea, and I'll try and keep this succinct, but essentially the idea that I like to float to government anytime I get an audience is a mechanism by which the government would return a portion of the HST collected in the municipalities it's earned to those very municipalities, thus creating essentially a virtuous circle whereby build more houses, get more dollars for infrastructure, and do it in a formulaic way that people know, government knows what that relationship is and can make a plan and can invest for the future. Um, I think we all know that one of the things that government can do for housing and certainly for supply is to invest in infrastructure that supports housing. The problem is everybody's got their hand out and no one seems to have any money. But when I talk to government, particularly the federal government, I don't think anyone expected house prices to go up 40% since 2020. I don't think anyone budgeted for the amount of HST dollars that were actually collected. The problem is, is they went into the general coffers and got spread like peanut butter across the issues of the day right across the country. And the truth is we need the dollars to go where the housing is needed the most. And we need them to go proportionate to the cost of growing those areas. Um, if you think about it from a political perspective, you would say, okay, well, someone in a small town is gonna say that's unfair. I say the answer is no, it's actually absolutely fair. Because if you build houses here, proportionate to the infrastructure you require, you'll get the exact same dollars on a percentage basis that a Toronto or a Vancouver or a Calgary um, needs to support the growth of those cities and those major centers where we know the majority of those million people of infrastructure or um, immigration are also going. So trying to put it all together, is there a way to create a permanent deal, very similar to what was done with the gas tax many years ago, where you direct drive the funds collected in the jurisdiction they're collected back so you have this virtuous circle of funding? The, the Fed's just announced in their budget coming out April 16th, $6 billion towards infrastructure in their uh, direct, direct into their housing fund. Uh, is that enough? Is, it, is, that, is that a pimple on an elephant? And, and won't most of that go to municipal infrastructure that's currently crumbling and not new and therefore not have any impact on new housing? What, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief and then turn it over to some of the other panelists. But um, first of all, it's not near enough. And it's not certain enough. It's these type of programs that require, you know, the beg, the beg program. <laughs> I got to apply for it. I've got to try and justify the, the amount that I'm going to get as opposed to if I build, I know what I collect back. 
Um, one other real small thing I'll throw out there is I think we need to legislate a linkage between property tax increases and development charge increases. We need to get the population and the electorate, the politicians and the electorate, thinking about how they're proportionately burdening those who have a home and those who don't have a home. If you want to sol solve a housing crisis, you've got to focus more on home seekers, not just homeowners. And unfortunately, re-election politics and new, new housing policy politics aren't always uh, moving in the same stream. So, you know, is there a way to get people to think about both? And I'm not saying dollar for dollar, but on some ratio that's um, formulaically linked. It's a very, very important point. Uh, over to Fred. What, what on the same, on the same theme, uh, do you want to add to that? You know, Brad made a, a, a ton of fantastic points. <clears throat> what I would add to it is that, you know, government is very opportunistic. And when for 34 years, they don't make any changes to revisit on the basis of a platform for calculation, it tells you something. It tells you that there's a windfall for them. The industry has had a bit of a, a, a bad rap as it relates to, um, you know, having public sentiment in the favor of housing. Uh, and so they've been able to ride that platform um, where they were collecting tons of funds. And so they didn't want to revisit it. The uh, turn of events now where housing and affordability is so important provides us an opportunity to lay on top of Brad's comments the need to go after the government, uh, you know, for accountability. Uh, their math doesn't work. Um, if you consider the fact that the increase in prices on uh, housing is uh, largely made up of the increase in pricing on land then the, the increase in the collection that they've been taking has been in an area where they never sought to actually tax in the first place. Uh, it's quite possible that 40% of the value of a lot or the cost of, per, uh, of uh, creating housing right now is based upon uh, the actual cost of land. And I think that it's time to revisit how they did the base calculation here because I don't believe that it matches the original intent of the legislation. Um, on top of that, you know, you talk in terms of investment into the infrastructure side of the equation. Uh, I believe you know, that that is something that is long overdue. Uh, during the COVID period, municipalities, provinces, and government uh, overall have uh, taken a pause and actually you know, getting out there and, and, and they're tremendously behind now on the uh, infrastructure. And that concerns me because if we're on the precipice of a, an increase in opportunity for building, you know, there's gonna be, uh, a, there's a limited number of individuals that can deliver that infrastructure out there for us which is gonna create a competition out there because we're behind everywhere and government's gonna all of a sudden uh, throw money into the infrastructure bubble. It's gonna create some, some uh, further increases in, 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 uh, uh, in, um, in infrastructure building. So, you know, we need to have it. It's gonna have some consequences, but I think that it's a great opportunity for us to revisit how they calculated this thing in the first place, hold them accountable to do an audit, if you will, of how the HST was calculated originally and the windfall that they're getting out of it now. Um, not to be controversial, but I do honestly believe that when it comes to my business, our business, that the government sits in the room almost like a grifter. You know, it's almost like you got to piecemeal them this big chunk of pie. And they are the, the biggest uh, winners when it comes to taxation on housing. And they've got to they've got to own up to it. And the first thing they should do is to do a recalc and increase the rebate portion at the very least. Uh, so that it is consistent with what the original intent of that calculation was supposed to be. Uh, very, very good points, Fred. I mean, it all really comes down to an opening the books on the financial methodology and the financial process for a municipality and delivering their services. And the uh, today it's been just add on, add on, add on, add on without a really fundamental review of, of where they sit. I mean, there's a great sympathy for the municipality and they can't run a deficit. And how else do they find ways to finance this pressures of growth? It's a it's a really uh, it's a really critical area for both our industry and and for the municipalities themselves. So that, that's leadership at the province and probably the federal government as well. Maybe it's in all three levels of uh, triumvirate here that needs to have a look at both rather than just yeah. just handing out the box, uh, reviewing 
how it's done. Lee, in your world, Empire has had tremendous success in small town Ontario. And uh, how are you finding this relationship uh, with the municipal side and, and, uh, and how are you doing it? I'm, I'm not sure Lasani's so happy to be seeing you there right in his backyard, but at the same time, he loves the competition. But uh, congratulations on your new world at Empire and, uh, and what you've been doing has been setting the market a bit uh, topsy-turvy down there in beautiful Thorold, I think it is. Over yeah. to you for comment. Thanks, Andy. Uh, yeah, just adding a little bit to what Brad and Fred already shared. Um, the Empire's view is the same. The HST rebate was introduced to help make homes more affordable for Canadians. And when introduced, the intention was to revisit the program to align with inflation. However, as we just discussed today, we haven't seen that happen yet. And then furthermore, the federal government also recently lifted the HST burden on purpose-built rentals without making any adjustments to the HST rebate program. So today, if the government doesn't seem to be as interested in keeping with the original intention on the program's mandate, which is affordability, then we agree that the next best thing for Canadians is the preservation of their investment. And that can come through several channels. One is what you discussed today, like investing in the surrounding infrastructure of the development. Another idea that we've been discussing here as well is maybe some of that could also help towards subsidizing this transition towards builders having to move towards net zero. And I just think at the moment, a lot of Canadians are left here with this affordability crisis without a clear understanding of how contrib their contributed capital to HST and other government fees, how they're spent and reinvested in the housing world when the taxes are coming from the housing world, to your point, through HST development charges and just showing a little more transparency on how that's going back into their homes and communities. Very good, Lee. Very interesting. HST taken off purpose-built rental. Why, why not take it off new housing? Now, that'd be tremendously stimulated, I would think. Uh, maybe it's for a specific period of time, or maybe it's on to a first-time buyer or the entry-level product. Uh, so there's some limitation on it, but uh, it's a matter of fairness and application. Uh, I think we have to be careful of demand-driven stimulus. We've all been, uh, we all are the beneficiary of the demand-driven stimulus, but, a, but an over-stimulus will spark and spike prices, which we don't want to have happen. We want stability. So you, you, we, I think we have to focus as much on the supply side uh, as the demand side. And politically, it's very easy to focus on the demand side. It's been the pattern of our history of, of, of the relationships between the industry and government and that we generally focus more on the demand side, it's easier. The supply side takes time, energy, focus, and big, big money to put that uh, infrastructure in the ground. Uh, now, now let's fire over to Sean. Sorry, Chris, I think I have to turn back to you for That's a question. That's okay. Hey, over Sean. Sean. Yeah. Uh, land, let's talk a little bit about land. I mean, over the last few years, land has, you had a little bit of a journey. Um, where are you seeing today with the raw material? Um, are you seeing it following any market correction? And also, what kind of dirt are you walking around on these days, Sean? Funny that you say that, Chris. I think you called me while I was walking the farm field. Um, we haven't seen the adjustment on the land side that I would have liked to have seen uh, through some of the market correction in terms of house pricing. Um, and I think that becomes quite a bit due to just literally land supply um, and where we are with regards to municipal urban boundaries, existing infrastructure. There is only so much land supply currently available where it would be shovel ready dirt. Uh, unfortunately, therefore, it comes at a premium. Um, you're having to deal with long uh, approval processes, which are also driving it up. Um, I don't believe that we've seen that market correction there. I would like to have um, in terms of like where we're looking, we're just having to press farther and farther outside of the GTA. So like, like Empire, we're pursuing new markets, Niagara, we're looking in Barrie, we're going beyond Waterloo, Cambridge, you, uh, noting the GTA is kind of that central area, uh, just to try to find that affordability, um, but doesn't necessarily drive where infrastructure is available. 
Uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I've been trying to negotiate some land deals recently where unfortunately our landholders are still thinking 2021, 2022 price per acre, uh, if not seeing it actually go up because they know that uh, their available opportunity is, is one of few opportunities out there uh, for future development. Right, right. How about everyone else? Are you are you are you are you seeing the same things, Brad? You know, Chris. Yeah, you know, yeah. this is interesting because uh, I know that there's uh, you know a lot of um, um, a lot of uh, concerns of, about pricing over the past several years. Now, I can tell you that we haven't really acquired a ton of property over the last twenty four months, but we did a lot of you know assemblies prior to that. And, um, you know, so we're sitting on a, an inventory of land that's going to be sufficient for us for some time to come. We're only really jumping into the game uh, when it comes to having to purchase today in circumstances where it helps us to fill out some of our current communities. What has happened that's interesting, however, is that the uh, last 24 months, uh, with some of the changes that were made by the provincial government as it relates to the um, uh, LPAT and so on, the number of properties that we've been able to get through the approval process because of settlement, has been tremendous, 11 properties last year alone. And subsequently, we're sitting on shovel-ready property in, in a ton of instances. So the need for us to have to go out there and replenish properties isn't so much. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, and I, I know that we're not the only ones in that situation. So uh, hopefully that, plus the knowledge that DCs, have, uh, especially now in the review period leading up to July, are going to hit astronomical numbers, City of Hamilton singles at $100,000 alone. I hope that that uh, does enough to kind of signal across the board, you know, a lack of intent by investors to want to spend, you know, uh, the kind of uh, acreage dollars that we've had to pay in the past. Right, right. Thanks, Fred. Andy, over to you. I think we're going to hit on approvals. Sure. I, uh, uh, or stay on any comments on the land side of Brad, what do we, how do we, if, if we increase supply dramatically, quickly, maybe that's impossible, that's an oxymoron, uh, but how do we stabilize that land value or does that, does that not happen? It just, it's just impossible uh, that the, the base price as, this, as, as has been established over the last several, uh, uh, let's call it the last five to eight years, uh, is not going to significantly change. Uh, we can't move supply quickly enough to cause it at least to stabilize. What, what's your thought on that? I, I, first of all, lots of thoughts there. Um, I always remind us that the new home industry is a function of the larger housing industry. And there's a whole lot of Canadians that are in houses that they perceive are worth a certain price. A fundamental correction in housing prices is highly, highly unlikely. And so that being said, the price of land is unlikely to abate significantly from where it is, per Sean's point, around, you know, there it just isn't that much of it. I'm going to maybe create a bridge here for you, Andy, but the reality is the approvals and the timeline around the approvals are the fundamental thing we have to go to war on to justify all this. We need to speed up the process to create more supply, not look for that supply to get cheaper. And in doing so, if we speed it up, all of the returns in the industry will support delivering more product to the market without significant house price inflation. My biggest fear right now is the inflation that is likely to come in house prices when interest rates go down. And I think on this call, we'll all agree that the trajectory is more likely down than flat or certainly than up, um, that could cause another you know, spike. And I don't think that's what any of us want. We want a stable housing market that continues to perform well, gives us opportunity, but gives us the opportunity also to house the population at affordable prices. And so I think this all comes back to what you said in your opening comments, around approvals and the speed of approvals and why our market is fundamentally broken. Um, we got to figure out a way to make things happen faster. How do we do that? I mean, the gatekeepers, we in the G7, uh, the data that just came out a month ago, uh, we are the longest period of time in the entire G7 uh, for approval process. Uh, my comparison to Houston was 18 months versus 10 years. 
Uh, how do we uh, open the hearts of the gatekeeper? I mean, when you walk into a, a municipal office in uh, many American cities that we now have to compete against for job creation or business investment, uh, you'll walk into an American city and they'll open their arms and say, what can we do for you today? And when you walk into the C comparative Canadian municipal office, the arms are folded and, and it's almost, oh, another developer, uh, step in line, please, we'll talk to you next month. And it's there's a fundamental shift here that has to happen. Uh, I, I don't know how we do that. How do we break this system of adversarial position gatekeeping in the approval process of housing because as you point out this is the cornerstone to unleash supply uh brad and then fred and sean lee all jump in oh uh, uh, it's not as it's not a silver bullet and it's not easy to do but i'll i'll suggest that empowerment is probably one of the number one things that we can do and what i mean by that is we can empower middle management the the true doers in our municipal, regional, provincial offices that have the ability to advance housing approvals faster, that generation that's sitting in those more middle tier jobs, they're the very people that are looking to buy a house themselves. They yeah. wanna help solve this crisis. I think the stereotype that you gave um, is somewhat true, but I think it exists in more the upper tiers of the government roles, not the middle tiers. I, I'm going to believe that there's a lot of millennials and Gen Zs coming into those government jobs that want to help solve this crisis. We need to empower them to do so. We need to give them authority to do so. And to be honest, I think we need on both the developer side, and I'm, this might be controversial, and the municipal side, we need to move to a use it or lose it policy. On the municipal side, if you don't comment in a round of circulation, you lose your right to comment. None of this coming back in on circulation three or four and upsetting the apple cart and elongating the process. Conservation authorities, municipalities, regions, you got one shot at commenting, get yourself in the conversation or you're out. Similarly, on the developer side, you can't hoard approvals. If you, if you get something approved and you drive it ahead, bring it to the market. And if you don't, there's a timeline where don't start, don't sell, don't build, lose that approval. Very, very good points. Fred? You know, I got to agree entirely with the comments about use it or lose it because that treadmill of comments is terrible. Uh, so, you know, 100% in that regard. You know, um, empowerment of middle, middle management there, Brad, I, I agree entirely. I just think that um, it's very difficult to turn that ship around when it comes to the culture at the municipality. Uh, I think we're stuck with that for quite some time before it actually changes because they feel that they've lost control with the uh, legislation that's been imposed upon them from, the, from the, uh, the provincial government. And they use it as a crutch all the time. Um, what I can say is that, as I commented earlier, uh, the province needs to use LPAT uh, to a higher level. They've got to invest more money in LPAT. They've got to create more opportunities for those uh, hearings to come on sooner. Because as a tool, what it has done and what it will do is it forces the issue away from the politicians. It forces the issue into the hands of professionals that can then discuss real solutions and it moves it towards settlement and it works. We just need more of it. And I think that uh, in every, every instance where it's possible, a municipality will try to slow down the process. But because you have a hearing date that's on the horizon, everybody will focus on trying to get it done prior to them having to go to the hearings. And that's worked very positively for us. I think it also needs to be used, you know, on site plan approval processes. And uh, if it could be used in a manner to try to get our engineering approvals through quicker, then that would be great as well. But I don't see that as, as, as much of a tool. But the province has done good things as it relates to the utilization of, uh, of the uh, tribunal for the purposes of bringing municipalities to the table. And uh, I think investment in that area um, will just be better for us. Lee, any comment on that from Empire's perspective? I think they've spoken very well to the approval challenges that we're seeing. And I do think part of it is getting the, I, I like the conversation I heard today about getting that middle management feeling like empowered and in that room and able to move the applications forward and not constantly have to get 
additional approvals on the like circulation and comments to speed up to make sure the right decision makers are in the room at each of those meetings and providing all those comments the very first time so they can be addressed in a much more timely manner. Creation of a culture of partnership, right? Yeah. Time and time is money. Sean. Yeah, no, I, I really love this dialogue, especially that word empowerment. Um, you know, I, I found recently um, with some of our municipalities that some of them have been true partners in trying to achieve housing now. But, you know, I, I was on the phone with one of the legal departments uh, in one of our communities. I've had a draft plan approved site for two years waiting on a subdivision agreement. All of my comments have been addressed and it's literally just legal addressing my subdivision agreement, two years. Um, so I've carried that land, that land carry cost impacts affordability. Um, but having a conversation with that legal department, um, not saying names, she's the third lawyer from that municipality on my file. Um, they're having staffing challenges. She was equally frustrated as I was. She has a stack of applications on her desk. She doesn't have the support to address them. And it's she's having to get herself acquainted with those files to actually bring it forward. So it's almost like we hit a reset button on my clock every time a new lawyer got involved with this subdivision agreement. And it's really unfortunate that um, I, I do agree with that empowerment. Why? Um, I think staff need more ability to move files forward. I find that with the higher management, it does get bottlenecked. Um, and they're, they're, I, I hear of staff's complaints. They're, they don't have enough resources. They don't have enough team members to actually adequately move it. Like we've got amazing immigration happening right now. How about some of those engineers, those planners getting into municipal jobs and moving provincial or municipal approvals forward faster? Um, that would be really great because uh, actually one of our biggest things for both affordability, land supply is just getting through the approval process. And we're actually trying to pick municipalities now that we see um, at least consistency in their approval process or moving things forward. The unfortunate is we all know every four years, their direction, their vision can change quite dramatically, which then again kind of resets how we move those approvals forward. And I think uh, Brad mentioned a good point earlier, uh, or sorry, it was Fred. Um, there, there's a, a delay and a, a behind on infrastructure that should already be there. There's been great opportunities for municipalities to have moved, you know, uh, sanitary lift stations, went primary water mains forward years ago. They had the funds for it uh, through HST collection DCs, and unfortunately they didn't. And then now when you go through, you know, the environmental process that takes up to 24 months through tendering reports, studies, that that's a real uh, delay on where we go with approvals and available land, our supply. So that, that's a great uh, conclusion of empowerment through partnership. We're not in an adversarial role. We need to do this together and, and find ways to walk down the aisle together to move this process along faster and more efficiently. Time is money, and that's really been the story of where our delays and complications occur. Uh, it's all very powerful. Chris, let's move it over to product. And innovation creativity. You know, we, when we kicked off this call there was a sentiment that we heard of you know use this time to hone your craft and retool and strategize right so lee um from your vantage point what is the trend in product design sizes incentive spec um that you know you guys are working on to help try and come to the table on these affordability challenges um are you seeing are there any specific nuances to um, market-centric requirements? Are you getting different um, feedback from certain areas over others on innovation? For sure. Um, so right now, I think you're seeing product trend towards affordability, but also towards having flexibility within the product that you're launching. So for example, um, a lot of the townhomes that we're looking at to sell now in current markets outside of the GTA, we're actually looking at separate entrances to the homes. And again, that offers that flexibility to the product, whether it's to accommodate a rental unit or whether it's to help new, Can new Canadians who may be living with extended family members, just added that flexibility to meet the home buyer's needs for what that housing will be. The other thing we're also noticing is that within our product lines, we're noticing people are definitely going towards the largest square footage they can within a townhome. 
or within a 26 or within a 33 before moving on to that next model, which again, I think is just driven again by affordability. And for new product, what I think Empire is doing a phenomenal job at right now is looking at how can we get back to a starter home? How can we get back to a home that meets all the needs of a family, can be a detached home, but maybe instead of each bedroom having an ensuite, maybe you have homes with a little bit more shared spaces, but that house, that G, the overall square footage, the layout, it still meets the needs of families today at an affordable price point. So we have a bunch of new product within that kind of philosophy of design that we are looking to bring out to the market. And regarding incentives, I think some of the incentives we're seeing in the marketplace today, um, I know on our sites and other launches, is you're starting to see builders offering appliances on low-rise and detached homes. You're starting to see bonus packages offered because I think what you're seeing in the incentives is almost helping someone buy their dream home at point of sale rather than have to wait for that decor appointment to again add additional features into the home and add to the cost of the home. So I think a lot of the incentives are driven around affordability and um, making getting your dream home still in the location you want at that more affordable price. And with realistic expectations, right? Like mom and yes. dad would have told us, no, you don't get to have this house as your first one. You have to start somewhere. Yes. And, you know, maybe by value engineering the features and finishes to come out with a price point that's more attractive to that first time home buyer or move up, slow move up through up the property ladder, that's where you'll have it. And guess what? By moving the excitement or sharing the excitement from the point of sale at the sales office to the design center, we might go back to selling a lot more upgrades too if we lower the spec at the onset of the sale. Just some ideas. Sean, um, Andy, I'm just going to keep going. Um, oh, you, know, uh, you know, Sean, similar uh, similar vein of questioning here. Uh, you know, I've known you for some time and, you know, I think the market has got to know you as, you know, like the customer-centric holistic builder in the marketplace. What are some of the things you can, you can talk about in innovation that you and your team have been bringing to market these days? Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, being a, a customer service focused, uh, we've been really trying to listen for what our customers have been telling us. So like Lee was mentioning with regards to, uh, you know, side entries, looking for options for affordability, or I love Brad's comment at the very beginning of going back to the basics. We too are, you know, what, what are those requirements? What is really making our customer happy with regards to getting them into their first home or, or combating that affordability? We might not be offering those uh, high-end luxuries that we weren't once upon a time doing like an ensuite on every bathroom in a four-bedroom house as an example. Um, in terms of us, we really are trying to approach that affordability and cash flow for our homeowners. Um, what we've done is we've already moved into accessory dwelling units. We've actually been doing them for a few years, um, actually. Uh, in uh, Norfolk County, we did 12. Now in the Niagara region, we're actually offering them in all of our low-rise product. In Caledon, we're doing multi-gen suites. Um, why? Uh, we're recognizing the affordability issue where you need multiple incomes potentially to afford a home. You have uh, those with family members that are needing to live in the same home as their younger children or vice versa. Uh, we're trying to make sure that you know you've got that rentable basement or the rentable upstairs or the rentable entire home. Again, trying to focus on that affordability. Um, what we saw and what we've heard over the last few months with regards to, you know, cash and incentives, um, we tried to develop something different. Um, we did what we called our Lifesaver Mortgage Program. Instead of it just being a traditional cash back on close, um, we're actually putting up to $1,000 a month into our homeowner's bank account uh, for up to 24 months after closing, really trying to help them with their, their cash flow. I mean, other, other initiatives that we've been doing is, um, you may recall, uh, we actually did the first 12 net zero ready homes in the GTA back in 2012. Uh, we've gone back to focusing on sustainability and our building practices. Um, how, do we, how do we make our homes more efficient, more comfortable? Uh, and again, going back to the phrase, really making it customer focused. What, what, are we, what are we listening for and reliably delivering uh, that they need and making sure that we can do it in an affordable way? And it becomes the differentiator that brings people to you when you do it effectively. Yeah. You know, one of the things, are, oh, sorry. Sorry, go, Sean. I was going to say, one of the things we've also decided to do is like, it's not just about Dunsire from a perspective of 
how to work with our homeowners. We appreciate that a lot of people aren't in the opportunity to buy, purchase their first home right now. Um, so we've actually decided to also pivot into purpose-built rental. Uh, we actually have multiple communities coming to market for purpose-built rental, uh, where we'll actually be partnering with um, when you've uh, rented from Dunsire, um, your rent will actually be contributing towards your future new home purchase uh, because we want to see that life cycle of, you know, we're not just a new home builder, we're a home builder. And that may be rental, that may be new home. And again, trying to support people from day one in moving through their home purchase and their home journey. That's an awesome idea. And it's been proven, you know, that that collection and credit on your, as a rental customer, to um, you know, stash away for their home, uh, you yeah. know that you can deliver to them is brilliant. Lee, you and I would remember in that from our from one of our previous employers. Um, you know, Lee, you and I are uh, have been known each other and tracked along in the industry for a while as marketing and salespeople, right? Sales experts. Aside from the product innovation, um, what could we be doing to improve the customer experience? Um, I think as we're refocusing a lot on that end user, it's really important that we begin to educate our purchasers about what to expect during a pre-construction like sale and that home journey process to final close. So specifically deal detailing to our purchasers what to expect during the purchasing phase, the pre-closing phase, the closing phase, and the warranty phases. And Empire here, we like to measure our customer service and we like to use the net promoter score because we really want to collect feedback, then we want to listen to that feedback, and then we want to act on that feedback. And if we're not register, if we're not measuring what our customer satisfaction levels are, it's hard to understand where we really need to improve. So we're measuring that, we're taking surveys, we're listening to their feedback, we're connecting with them as much as we can, and we're really working with them during this process of them moving into their home to make sure that it's a great experience for everybody and a memorable experience. Is it just it just promotes and encourages repeat life cycle home ownership purchases? Yes, Fred. I want to come back to you, and you know, it's we're going to go a little off script. Uh, Sean um, brought up some really interesting points about uh, purpose built rental and his activity there. Um, I'd love to hear what you're doing. I know you you've got a lot of stuff on the rental side, and it's it's, it's timely right now in this conversation, Fred. Yeah, you know what? First of all, it's great to know that everybody's on the same page when it comes to the this uh, this period and how uh, the uh, you know um, accessory dwelling units and um, uh, multi gen kind of platforms for flex space is enabling individuals to um, really uh, find different ways to be able to get income into their homes uh, and then also to address uh, you know the real factors of the changing family unit out there and uh, it's being grasped I think it's a huge game changer is the point okay um, we decided. 15 years ago that we wanted to get into the uh, purpose-built rental marketplace. And uh, we've had some good success in it. We have over 10,000 units that are on our books, of which about 6,000 are already approved for moving forward. We have a 300-unit building that's going up right now. It starts leasing in the latter part of this year. I think that the, mat the, the, the maturation of this purpose-built rental environment, where everybody's getting on the, 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 the bandwagon for, is going to completely change you know, the lifestyle options that are available for people out there. Uh, we just haven't had the quality of rental product that people deserve in the marketplace that would, you know, um, that, that would make them move out of their current residence, pocket that uh, equity that they have in their current home, help their families, help their children to afford housing that is otherwise unaffordable. Uh, I find that, the, you know, the recent change that have taken place with regards to the HST exemptions don't go far enough, unfortunately. I think it's very positive, except that I believe they've got to make some accommodations for the transition of those tax rules as it applies to buildings that have already been started. I don't think it's fair that buildings that started two months before the introduction of that legislation in the fall is, um, you know, should be penalized against those that started afterwards. Uh, there's going to be some incredible opportunities, affordable and then incredibly amenitized. And I think that if we we, we learn those lessons that we we um, that we gained through the COVID period, you know, people working from home, wanting we work stay, uh, spaces within the rental spaces, having amenities that are that create a better quality of life experience, despite the fact that you're going to be living in a 541 square foot one bedroom apartment, is incredible. And I think it just, you know, I've seen the uh, the changes that it has done to the, uh, um, you know, to the housing environment in Nashville, Tennessee, which I think is one of the 
the fastest growing uh, markets in the U.S. and one of the leaders when it comes to purpose-built rental. And I think it's going to change the landscape of, uh, of uh, diversity available. We're also delving into some of the low-rise options as it relates to um, the um, uh, the rental sector. And we're excited by it. By it. I think it uh, also provides our industry, you know, uh, for those of us who want to delve into that uh, into that property management state, uh, a lot more stability. But we know that leaders in our industry have that stability already. But as you go through these economic cycles, you know, it gives you the strength to be able to build your infrastructure and to be able to rely upon a staff that has a great base from which to to uh, to work from. So uh, yeah, we love the space tremendously. Thanks, Fred. You know, I'm looking at the time. You know, I, I, we we try and keep these to an hour. And we've got about four or five minutes left. I'm, we may end up going a little over, but I want to be, you know, uh, cautious of that. A um, couple of, and I, I don't want to miss some of the Q and A from from the audience. And Andy, I'm going to throw this one over to you. It's a two two um, two uh, different questions or comments, but one that we'll just love on the demand side. Isn't it high time we remove the stress test for financing? There you go. There's nothing uh, really to say about that one. But the question. So thank you for that anonymous uh, the anonymous attendee oh. of the audience. Um, Peter mentions um, how much of an interest rate discount, and Andy, I'm going to give this one to you and then the group maybe, how much of an interest rate discount is required to make a significant impact in the housing market for sales, development, investment, and renovation spending? Well, the, the, the MQR is a point of, uh, let me say, a pride and protection from the Bank of Canada from OSFI and from the Minister of Finance federally. I think we've lost Andy. Chris, we got a frozen Andy. We got a frozen Andy. Oh, he's I'm back. Frozen. Andy. I'm frozen. Sorry. Sorry. Start we over. have a here we go. I froze. I froze. You're good. Uh, we have a we have a a debt level on the Canadian scene, which is uh, one of the highest in the G7. And as a result, uh, the, the Bank of Canada and OSFI and, and the and Minister of Finance are probably going to hold on that MQR for some time. They, they gave relief to renewals, uh, mainly because of the issues of, of two thirds of our our mortgages in Canada coming up for renewal in 24 and early 25. So they gave relief on that platform. We'd love to see it universally, but I, I just don't see that happening. We're going to have to live with that one for a while longer. On, I, I, I'd like to actually flip myself back over to Brad because, you know, Brad's been leading the market charge here on on sales volume. Everywhere we turn, he's, Madam, he's uh, doing a, a spectacular job. Uh Brad, how did you how did you happen to pull this one off? You you've been leading the pack historically and you're doing it again i think it's uh it's largely philosophical in our approach and you know uh, similar to fred we're very fortunate in that we do have uh, a significant supply of land um, so building through this cycle as a way to um i'll go back to my opening comment go back to the basics um the market was frothy and we all recognize it was frothy um Part of that frothiness created some behaviors that I think we would all agree need to be rooted out of our industry. We need to get more productive. We need to get more efficient. And we need to rely less on the inflation within our market to support our margins. And I believe by building through this, by selling through this, we can go after the trades. We can drive those trade costs down. We can hopefully adjust some terms on uh, on land prices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I focus, Mattamy focuses, and Peter's taught us to focus for many years on return, not margin. And so sitting on the sidelines and waiting for a better margin isn't always the only strategy. Um, fully appreciate that everybody's in a different situation. Fully appreciate that replacing land is very challenging. But I do hope that the efforts of Mattamy will benefit the entire industry as we look through look to build through a cycle that needs a reset. Are you shifting to more factory component built parts? Or, I mean, in other words, if I look at efficiency in, in material through trade, and when I've got a shortage of labor, uh, 
and uh, and and pressure on material costs is is the factory built component, the even modular component parts, uh, an answer here. I think it's part of the answer, Andy. But I'll um, I'll be a little provocative here and say that I believe the 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 noise around that solution is getting too loud. It is not a silver bullet. And it's a last mile solution to a downstream problem. That is, we're not getting our approvals fast enough. At Mattamy today, um, much to my chagrin, I wish it was even faster. It takes us about 145 days to build a single family home. With manufactured components, maybe we can drive that down to 110. But that doesn't change the fact that, to your point, it takes 10 years to get the land approved. So. <laughs> Yes, manufacturing is a part of the solution. Yes, manufacturing will help address the skilled trades crisis, but please don't let that false narrative become somehow perceived as a panacea when really we've got to go after land approvals and we've got to go after land supply. And finally, through the pandemic, we had this surge in uh, consumer demand that drove uh, a want rather than a need and we got bigger and fancier and uh are we getting smaller lower spec uh more is back to basics more basic product uh delivery in these times is, is that part of a solution yeah I, I think so i think lee made some really good points around that i think the fundamental thing that the industry is doing and doing very well is they're finding ways to put very livable, very desirable homes on smaller components of land. The reality is, is the number one input cost into housing is land. Fred made that point earlier. And we just need to get really creative. We need to look to other jurisdictions across the globe and even on this continent. California does some fantastic jobs of dealing with high cost land with really creative built forms. Um, our industry is doing well. We can do more. and. Um, one of the things I'd say in closing, and I do have to jump, um, is let the industry be part of the solution. You know, I think Fred inferred it a little bit before. The reputation is so misplaced. I see in my colleagues on this call, I see in, in conversations I'm having all the time, the industry is the solution, is a big part of the solution. And instead of pigeonholing us as, you know, these nasty developers who only want to make a profit, let us bring our creativity, our professionalism, our innovation to the solution as a, as a real equal partner, not a part of the problem. Brad, you know, I was gonna ask you the question of what advice or guidance have you got for our audience this morning? So thank you for um, handling that wrap up right out of the gate. Um, we've got four rapid fires. I've got three left. Um, Sean, what regions or markets are you starting to take a closer look at lately? Sorry, just a meeting. Um, not giving away all my secrets, but uh, we are obviously focusing land acquisitions in our Jamaica opportunities, which doesn't necessarily focus here. Um, but we're focused in the Niagara region. We found that the trade partnerships, the supplies, and some of the municipalities have been really fantastic. Um, so we've been focusing in Niagara. Um, and then again, satellites to the GTA. Uh, we're now focused in the Barry market. We are focused uh, in the West End, meaning uh, Hamilton, Brampton, uh, Brantford, et cetera. Um, that's where we're seeing opportunities. Thanks, Sean. Brad, what markets are you a little bit surprised at? Good, bad, ugly? Like what What just kind of knocked you off the side of the head? Well, you know, I, I've got I've to send my compliments out to Empire for having uh, been able to, um, you know, penetrate the small builder marketplaces uh, over the past 20 years as they have, you know, we've got a good relationship with Empire having built uh, large scale communities within these small areas, just been broken down moving into St. George in the Brantford area as well. Um, I just think that, uh, you know, any community out there that, that it is never too small for an opportunity. I uh, am always surprised by how the marketplace will respond uh, to an opportunity to move to a new town. They are mobile. You know, um, we are selling more out of centralized sales centers uh, so that they have an opportunity, the, the marketplace has an opportunity to, to come in and see all of the communities uh, that, that we have to offer because they will consider Paris, they'll consider Bradford, they'll consider the Halton area as much as they'll consider uh, areas within Niagara. 
oftentimes what they're going after is a quality of life issue. It's do I have access with regards to the multiple um, uh, transportation corridors? What's my budget, the type of house that I want to get into? And then they would also then look at uh, location. I still think location is is primary, but um, you know the the, uh, the movement towards finding affordability and quality of life, uh, that lesson that obviously came to shine on people more when it was um, you know through the COVID period has opened up opportunities tremendously. So, you know, you always heard of that, uh, that comment out there called, you know, NIMBY, not in my backyard. I kindly say to everybody, Goombi, you know, get out of my backyard. And I say it with the, the, the tongue in cheek. Uh, I welcome everyone that comes to the communities that we're in. And likewise, I hope that we're, we're welcome as well. Thanks, Fred. That was good. Lee, we're going to wrap it up with you. I'm going to let you choose. Um, you can either tell me what's keeping you up at night, or you can give me a couple of your most innovative and creative ideas that you're really going to dive into, whether it's in marketing, product, finance, construction, over at Empire. I'll let you choose which one you'd like to go to, and then we're going to do our draw. Great. Um, I think I'll share something we're doing a little bit on innovation. So I think, again, it's getting back to that like direct buyer and that end user. And uh, Empire is implementing a really strong online sales consultant program here, an OEC program and how we're driving our leads to that and then working from driving it to all of our sales offices but engaging with that lead from the very beginning and seeing what's their affordability where can they live and educating them on all the different offerings because the fred's point in niagara region you can have three towns all 20 minutes from each other and educating them quickly on what are the different product offerings to do there so we're trying to do that in a very effective manner. So I think that's what I'm definitely most excited about and also moving towards regional sales offices to also help to the buyer understand their full choice in their range of communities, affordability, housing options. And so that's what I'm most excited about. Love it. One call, we have it all, right? I yes. remember to do that with, you know, we would rent apartments at, when I was at Minto with a, a telephone information line, you know, one call, we have it all. And that gave you the, the customer the ability to say, okay, here's my criteria. Fred, yes. you're right. Maybe location's not as, mu not as important. And, you know, before the pandemic, we were always, you know, we coined the term, you know, drive till you qualify. Well, here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. You know, you guys are wonderful. You uh, Thank you for uh, Brad, Fred, for coming back. Uh, welcome, Lee and Sean. I hope you will come back after this. Um, it, great insights, great ideas. Always lovely to speak with each, each one of you. Um, our draw. We have our famous lunch draw, courtesy of CIDC. And our first winner is Dan Welton. Dan Welton from United Limbs. And congratulations, Dan. And our next winner is uh, Jeff McMurdo from Activa, Southwest Ontario, and a Mississauga Builder. Congratulations, gentlemen. I'd like to thank everyone on the panel. Again, I'd like to thank CIBC for being along this journey with us since day one. I'd also like to thank Leanne and Melissa from, from McEwitt Partnership. You guys have been here, you know, Leanne and I was telling, Lee and I were talking last night, five years ago, we got a call to get on a webinar. I, I remember getting the call and I was talking to Leanne and we decided within five minutes, it was time for us to do something ourselves. And here we are, we're still doing it today. Have a great afternoon, everyone. If you are interested in getting involved in our program, becoming a sponsor, maybe even getting on a panel, get in touch with me directly. My number is 905-415-2720, extension 232. We'll be doing a similar session at our next um, issue, similar type of content and discussion, different panel with a little bit of a high rise uh, uh, conversation. I really hope you'll look forward to being in the audience and, and seeing us again. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Enjoy April. See you soon. <laughs>